Hello and welcome to another segment with the Nairobi Hospital. Today we are joined by Dr. Nicola Okech and we will be talking about diabetes. Thank you for Karibu having sana, me. Dr. Asante sana. So what is diabetes? Diabetes is a group of disorders that are associated with high blood sugars. Uh, what happens to cause this high blood sugar is one, either the body does not produce enough insulin or it does not produce insulin at all. Mm. The other way that diabetes can occur is that the body produces insulin but the body is resistant to the amount of insulin that is produced. Mm. Insulin is important in that it, the way it works is that once someone takes in um, food which is converted to glucose, insulin helps that glucose to enter the cells of the body more so the liver, the fat, and the muscle. Mm -hmm. So once the glucose enters the cells of the body, the, the sugar in the blood is actually lowered. So when there's absence of that insulin, the sugar persists in the blood, and that mm -hmm. is usually what is picked up as high blood sugars. Mm -hmm. What are the types of diabetes that we have? There are three main types. There's type one diabetes, which is uh, basically there's absolutely no insulin. The body does not produce anything. Mm -hmm. So what happens in such patients is that they have the organ that produces insulin, which is the pancreas, mm -hmm. is either destroyed early in childhood, such that they are not able to produce insulin. The other way that that can occur is the body produces what we call antibodies that destroy this organ that produces insulin, and thus there's insufficient amount of insulin. Mm -hmm. So that's type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes it usually occurs because there is an insufficient amount of insulin produced or the body is resistant to insulin or it could also be a combination of both. The third type of diabetes is what we refer to as gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is when a lady comes to us and during maybe the second and the third trimester is when we diagnose that this patient has very elevated blood sugars. Now there should not be, there should not be a history of having had high blood sugars prior to the onset of pregnancy. That's when you diagnose gestational diabetes. What are some of the risk factors come with diabetes? When we talk about risk factors, we always, in the medical field, refer to it twofold. So there's the genetic aspect, and then there's what we call environmental factors. So in terms of genetics, mainly plays a very large role, especially in type 2 diabetics. They mainly have a family history of diabetes. You might find it in a first degree relative that is a sibling or a parent or even someone who's a bit distant. When it comes to environmental factors, and this is something that we are having a very big challenge with, the main uh, issue is the westernized type of lifestyle. So it's your diet, eating more refined sugars, being less immobile, okay? what we call a sedentary lifestyle, and then of course the issues of overweight and obesity. Those are the other issues that predispose people to getting mm -hmm. diabetes. But there are other complications that also come with the disease, like loss of uh, limbs? Or, uh, um, these usually happen when diabetes has remained undiagnosed for a long time. Mm -hmm. Most of the time what we find is that patients with type 1 diabetes tend to present early in childhood. Mm -hmm. So by the time they present, they haven't been exposed for a long time to very high sugars. Mm -hmm. So it's unlikely that they will present with complications. Complications are mostly in patients with type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. And uh, these complications include problems with the eyes, so type, uh, diabetes is the leading cause of preventable blindness, lower limb amputations, because diabetes tends to interfere with the blood vessels, especially towards the extremities of the body. Mm -hmm. Okay, So kidney failure is another complication. Strokes, heart diseases, mainly heart attacks, issues with the nerves, and then of course recurrent infections. Mm -hmm. Yes. How do we manage the disease? Twofold, as usual, mm -hmm. so lifestyle and medication. When you talk about lifestyle, mm -hmm. uh, we want to first address your diet. Mm -hmm. So preferably stay away from the refined sugars, the white sugars, white rice, white ugali, white flour. You want to go more for the unrefined high fiber sugars, okay? Mm -hmm. Then uh, increase your fruit and vegetable intake, of course. Okay? And then when it comes to physical activity, stay active. You know, most of us tend to have these white collar jobs. We are sitting in the office, in front of a computer, we are not mobilizing. So for someone who has that kind of a job, take advantage in, take the stairs instead of the lift. Mm -hmm. okay? Walk as much as you can. Okay? 
park your car far away from the entry point to your office so that you can get your steps in. But medically, we usually advocate for around 150 minutes of exercise per week, okay? So we say maybe between 30 to 45 minutes per day, three to five days a week. And then this kind of exercise must consist of what we refer to as aerobic, something that will get your heart pumping. So like jogging, a brisk walk or swimming. And including that, we also want to advocate for resistance exercises. Those are toning exercises, weight lifting and all that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what, what type of diabetes, because you've mentioned that there are the three types of diabetes, which one is most prevalent in our population in Kenya? In, unfortunately for Kenya, we don't have very hard statistics, okay. but generally, even worldwide, we know that 90% of patients with diabetes have type 2 diabetes. And unfortunately, that 90%, only one in two of patients will know they actually have diabetes. Mm -hmm. Mainly because type 2 diabetes is a slowly occurring kind of diabetes. The symptoms tend to be very mild and non-specific. Mm -hmm. So either people doesn't, don't take it seriously or they seek medical care when it's a bit too late. Mm -hmm. So 14th of November is marked as the World Diabetes Day, yes. the theme being family and diabetes. Yes. What are some of the programs that Nairobi Hospital has put in place uh, to mark this day? Well, we are encouraging our staff, of course, to, mo to know more about diabetes. So we have a couple of education programs that are ongoing mm -hmm. and that will be ongoing even come the week of uh, World Diabetes Day where we'll educate not just the medical personnel but even the rest of the hospital about recognizing symptoms and signs which might indicate that someone has diabetes. Mm -hmm. So in line with the World Diabetes Day, Nairobi Hospital will be carrying out a free screening next week on Thursday, mm -hmm. okay, 14th of November. Uh, we'll be checking people's blood sugar levels, trying to pick up who might be at risk or who has diabetes. And in addition to that, we'll also be checking uh, blood, uh, blood pressure levels. So if you're available and if you're curious to find out about where you lie, please come over to Nairobi Hospital. Is the treatment of diabetes expensive? I would say in our setting it can be a bit expensive, um, mainly because of the repeated number of tests and trying to come up with packages is something that Nairobi Hospital has tried to come up with so that you can actually reduce the cost to these patients because there are certain tests you need to do on a regular basis. Uh, in addition to the expense, um, you know you can look at it twofold. It can be expensive when you're seeking the medical care but it can be inexpensive in that once you modify your lifestyle it's unlikely that you will be pursuing these refined sugars, mm -hmm. this junk food. So you'll be settling more for the healthier foods. Mm -hmm. And those ones tend not to be very expensive. Mm -hmm. So expensive in the aspect of seeking medical care, yeah. yes. In line with the 14th of November, World mm -hmm. Diabetes Day, one of the message that you're putting out there as Nairobi Hospital is the importance of regular blood checkups so that you can know your sugar levels to avoid incidences of having diabetes unknowingly and getting to experience the complications that come with it. Yes. Yes. And not just in everyone because you also need to look at it in terms of what the financial aspect will be. You can't yes. screen the whole world for diabetes. Yeah. You need to choose the population that you're screening. So if someone has a family history of diabetes, if they have other comorbid conditions or other conditions that might be associated with diabetes, such as hypertension, mm -hmm. high cholesterol levels, okay, advancing age, okay, those are the things that you would want to make someone seek uh, health care and actually check for diabetes. Yeah. Okay. And if you're overweight or obese, mm -hmm. you also want to check your blood sugars. So once you have identified um, this population that is predisposed to getting or having diabetes, how regularly should they come for the checkups? So when you're talking about how regularly should one check, um, for those who are at risk of diabetes, every six months to a year is good enough. But there are some patients who we know we might need to follow up a bit more intensely. And these are the subgroup of women with what we call gestational diabetes. Eh? Gestational diabetes tends to resolve once a lady has given birth, but these patients are at risk of developing type 2 diabetes later. So for them, you check their blood sugar every six months. If within the first year they have not developed diabetes, then you can check it every three years or so. 
but always good to be vigilant and keep an eye on those patients. Mm -hmm. Of course, educate them on the symptoms that are diagnostic of diabetes. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. other than the insulin, insulin injections, we have other types of treatments, like the orals. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could take us through that. Okay, so when we are managing a patient with diabetes, other than what I've told you about lifestyle modification, uh, they are the option of giving the patient oral medication or insulin injections. Now, patients with type 1 diabetes mm -hmm. cannot survive on oral medications then they just have to be on insulin okay because their body is not producing insulin so they have to be on insulin from diagnosis okay patients with type 2 diabetes can sometimes be started on oral medication okay or they can sometimes be started on insulin I know most people tend to think that you start on orals then when orals fail you mm. go to insulin mm. but you can start on either or okay. Now the way oral medications work is that they stimulate the pancreas to produce more insulin, okay? That's one way. The other way is that they can make the body more sensitive to the amount of insulin that is circulating, okay? So when you're commencing a patient on oral medications, okay, you want to educate them and tell them at some point you might require insulin. This is something that I do with most of my patients because patients tend to be a bit resistant to insulin. Being on insulin as a type 2 diabetic from the onset does not mean that your diabetes is bad. Mm -hmm. It just means that we want to get you to target very fast, mm -hmm. okay? So insulin gets you to target faster mm -hmm. than oral medications. Mm -hmm. So there's the option of starting on oral medications or starting on insulin, insulin. directly. Mm -hmm. And even when we start on insulin, insulin, there's also the option that once we get you to target, we can change you back to the oral medication. Yeah. You don't necessarily have to be on insulin mm. for life. Mm. Yes. So this, this is just an example of an insulin pen. Um, this is what we usually use for patients who are on insulin. Mm. You might use a pen or you could use the insulin syringes and the insulin in a cartridge. Yeah? But because this is what I have now, I'll demonstrate how to use it. Yeah? So the pen comes preloaded with the insulin here, okay? And the dial-up portion to show you the amount of insulin that you need to give the patient. So when the patient comes with, gets the pen from the pharmacy, they will get the pen and the needle, given a set of needles. Yeah? So you uncap the needle, then your pen, stick it in here, and screw it shut, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you release that. Eh? So you can see the needle there, okay? Mm -hmm. They come in different sizes. This is an adult size, because it's quite long. Mm -hmm. For children, it's slightly smaller. Mm -hmm. And the, the needle being very thin, it tends to be almost painless, okay? So when you get the pen, you first have to load it, okay? You want to mix the amount of insulin inside there, okay? Make sure that it's equally distributed, mm -hmm. okay? And then you dial, this is zero, so you'll dial two units, and then you will release it, okay? To make sure that there's no air, okay? okay. Because if you inject air, essentially you're not injecting yourself any insulin. Okay. Then, for example, if the patient is to give themselves 10 units of insulin, okay? So you dial up to 10. You pinch your skin. Now the areas that you inject are around the umbilicus, okay, the thighs, the arms, and the upper outer buttock. Those are the areas. So you have to rotate. So you take the skin and pinch it in between. Inject at a 90 degree angle. Press the plunger until it goes down to zero. You see the insulin goes in. Hold on for a few seconds such that everything is delivered, then remove. So that's how you administer insulin. Then what I have here is a... Uh, Do you refill? Is it refillable? Or? No, once this is done, it's disposable. This is a disposable pen. Okay. It just so makes it, the package makes it easier for you to carry? Yes, or, okay. yes, it makes it easier for you to carry because this one you can actually carry it. No one will know you're a diabetic. That's why it looks like a pen. It lasts, depending on the amount of insulin you're giving yourself, huh? but usually around 28 days. Once 28 days are over, if there's anything left, you should discard. Okay, because it's unlikely that the insulin will still be potent. Mm. So this one is the glucometer. 
it's the monitoring device. It's important that patients, all patients with diabetes have a glucometer. There are different brands, okay? This is just an example. So when a patient has diabetes, it's important that they regularly check their sugars because in regularly checking their sugars, they will know one, if the medication they are taking is effective, mm -hmm. okay, and if they are on the correct uh, dosage. Mm -hmm. And then two, they will know how, when to check their blood. For example, if they are feeling ill mm -hmm. or if there's a certain food that suddenly spikes your sugars, mm -hmm. that the actual checks will give you an objective measure of that. Yes. So we usually tell our patients with diabetes, check your blood sugar at least two to three times a day. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the first time early in the morning before breakfast, that is what we call our fasting sugars. Mm -hmm. And then you check two hours after every meal. Mm -hmm. You can choose either to check after breakfast, after lunch or after dinner. Mm -hmm. Then that gives you an indication of your sugar control. Because a single reading will not tell you how effectively you controlled your uh, diabetes is, mm -hmm. but a series of readings will give you an indication of, of the control. Mm -hmm. So I want to demonstrate on you. <laughs> uh, do I have your consent? Yes, yes you do. <laughs> so you first clean the area, mm -hmm. preferably you use this one or this finger, okay. but we like to use this one. So you want to aim for the pulp of the finger, mm -hmm. okay, because that's where the arteries are mini. Okay, so you clean with your antiseptic cleaner. Then this is the needle, okay, for checking. So you remove it, okay. There is your blood. Take your blood. So the meter will tell you when to put the blood, eh? and then get some blood there. There you go. Yeah. So your blood sugar is 4.6, which is a good sugar. Yay. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> then, of course, you also have to discard what you've used safely. Okay. Okay. The needle needs to go in a needle-safe container. Okay. And the needle-safe container needs to be disposed in a hospital. So if you don't have a needle-safe, you just take a small jar with a lid dispose a couple of them. When it's full, you take it to the nearest health facility and they will dispose it for you. Why is that? Just because of needle safety. Okay. Yeah, because you don't want to dispose it with the rest of the garbage in mm -hmm. the house. Someone can prick themselves. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So what are the safe ranges? So for blood sugar levels, um, depending on which sample of blood you're testing, it's a fasting sample. Anything within four to seven millimoles per liter is considered normal. Okay. That's what even a normal person with, uh, with, uh, without diabetes should have. Mm -hmm. So a person with diabetes on treatment should fall within that range. Mm -hmm. Then after meal, usually two hours after meal, anything between five and ten is considered optimal control. Thank you very much for joining us in this episode about family and diabetes with Dr. Nicola Oketch. Please make sure to avail yourself next week on the 14th of November for the free medical screening on blood sugar and blood pressure. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you for the information that you've given us today. Thank you. I've been your host, Mutani Wabero.